TV, our various channels uh, across our pastoral team. For example, uh, Alvita King is a member of our full-time member of our pastoral team here at Priest for Life. We're broadcasting on her channels, and uh, Janet Morana, our executive director, and uh, all of our all of our team is just so happy to be bringing you uh, these broadcasts and these programs every day especially about this important election, this critical election, of which you are, you are a part, as, as are we. Uh, it is uh, important, Paul, to understand how Christians uh, can support President Trump. Of course, the question that we have is not only how can a Christian, but how can an American not support the most American uh, president that we have had, the most pro-America, the most pro-religious freedom, the most pro-God, the most pro-prayer, and the most pro-economy, the most pro-Israel, as we will see um, tonight, uh, Paul. And, you know, sometimes people ask these questions and you wonder, are they even paying attention uh, to all the things that uh, that President Trump is doing, but I'm telling you, we're going to be paying some attention tonight. And by the way, tomorrow night we have our book discussion. Now, every every week we we talk about a particular book, and uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about this one. It's called "For God and Country: The Christian Case for Trump," and it's written by Ralph Reed, one of the uh, country's uh, greatest um, political experts and. Uh, Conservative Voices for God and Country. We'll talk about this uh, tomorrow night, and uh, I'm sure you will be um, uh, inspired. The following week, we're going to uh, discuss this book here called The Catholic Case for Trump. It's by Austin Ruse, a colleague uh, colleague of ours and friend, uh, The Catholic Case for Trump. So uh, just as a reminder, we've been talking about... Um, uh, the books that we're going to be reading. So uh, if you have these books, if you can get these books and be ready to discuss them, if you haven't read them, uh, if, you know, if you don't have them, you'll enjoy the discussion anyway. And uh, we'll be doing that, as I say, tomorrow night. It's great to have so many of you here. Did you see what happened today at the White House? Uh, we're going to show you a clip here and then we're going to discuss it. This is one of the reasons, this is one of the ways that President Trump is making America great again, making America great again on the world stage. You know, when you think about the rhetoric that has been launched against the president from the very beginning, and you think about some of the silly things that have been said, such as that uh, he would be leading us into wars. You know exactly the opposite is what has been happening. He's been keeping us out of wars. There, 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 there have been in the history uh, of our country so many, as he calls them, uh, endless wars. Uh, where there's no exit strategy, where there's no clear plan, where there's no clear benefit of us being, uh, being in a position of, of war. And the president has come against that. And he said, no, we're not going to be in these endless wars. He has been bringing our troops back home. You know, he was uh, very tough with um, North Korea. And some people, again, were saying at the beginning, uh, well, you know, uh, we, we have to be careful, you know, the way he talks and, you know, uh, what he might do will end up in a war with North Korea. And North Korea was, you know, uh, engaging in, in aggressive activities and remember, you know, their various missile testing and all, all the rest. What happened? Where's the war? North Korea, they've really been getting worse, right? Just the opposite has happened. And he went over there and he, and he, he met with Kim Jong-un and uh, what happened? Where's the war? The man is a peacemaker. 
One of the most difficult areas of the world has, of course, been the Middle East, Israel, a biblical nation, the only democracy in the Middle East, a strong friend and ally of the United States, surrounded by people who want to, as their stated goal, explicitly wipe Israel off the face of the earth. This has been a very difficult region of the world and so difficult to get Israelis and Arabs to get along. The Palestinian problem, the relationships uh, between them and, and, and Israelis, constant source of tension, confusion, and difficulty. For the first time in 25 years, we have now a new peace accord in the Middle East with Israel exchanging diplomatic relations and other agreements of peaceful coexistence with the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, and also with Bahrain. Brothers and sisters, I want to show you what happened today. This has been in the news for some time. And uh, today, there was actually uh, the event, and the, the ceremony at the White House where this materialized. I want to listen here now to the remarks of the President and uh, of the um, Benjamin Netanyahu from Israel and uh, see the historic signing, representatives there from the UAE and uh, Bahrain. Let's take a look and let's see the history that was made the today right before our eyes under the leadership of President Donald Trump. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. The First Lady and I are honored to welcome to the White House Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel and Mrs. Netanyahu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And Foreign Minister Abdullah bin Zayed, United Arab Emirates, UAE. Thank you very much. And Foreign Minister Abdulazif Al Zani of Bahrain. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're here this afternoon to change the course of history. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. Thanks to the great courage of the leaders of these three countries, we take a major stride toward a future in which people of all faiths and backgrounds live together in peace and prosperity. In a few moments, these visionary leaders will sign the first two peace deals between Israel and the Arab state in more than a quarter or more to follow. Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain will establish embassies, exchange ambassadors, and begin the cooperate and work together so strongly to cooperate as partners across the broad range of sectors, from tourism to trade and healthcare to security. They're going to work together. They are friends. The Abraham Accords also opened the door for Muslims around the world to visit the historic sites in Israel and to peacefully pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the third holiest site in Islam.
Together, these agreements will serve as the foundation for a comprehensive peace across the entire region, something which nobody thought was possible, certainly not in this day and age, maybe in many decades from now, but one founded on shared interests, mutual respect, and friendship. To our honored guests from Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, congratulations on this outstanding achievement. Congratulations. Fantastic. I also want to thank Vice President Mike Pence. Thank you, Mike. Great job. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Mike, thank you very much. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien. Robert, thank you. Mr. Jared Kushner. Jared, thank you very much. Ambassador Brian Hook. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. And Avi Berkowitz. Avi, thank you very much. That's a very uh, great group of people, great group of patriots. They wanted this to happen so badly. They worked so hard. And again, nobody thought it could happen, and they thought it could happen. They never even doubted it. So I want to thank you all very much. Thank you. For generations, the people of the Middle East have been held back by old conflicts, hostilities, lies, treacheries, so many things held them back. Actually, lies that the Jews and Arabs were enemies and that Al-Aqsa Mosque was under attack. Constantly, they would say it was under attack. These lies passed down from generation to generation, fueled a vicious cycle of terror, and violence that spread across the region and all over the world. These agreements prove that the nations of the region are breaking free from the failed approaches of the past. Today's signing sets history on a new course, and there will be other countries very, very soon that will follow these great leaders. The people of the Middle East will no longer allow hatred of Israel to be fomented as an excuse for radicalism or extremism, so important. And they'll no longer allow the great destiny of their region to be denied. On my first foreign trip as president, I had the honor of addressing the leaders of more than 54 Arab and Muslim nations in Saudi Arabia. My message that day was very simple. I urge the nations of the Middle East to set aside their differences, unite against the common enemy of civilization, and work together toward the noble aims of security and prosperity. I offered America's friendship. I offered America's help. But I said clearly that the nations of the regions had to decide what kind of a future they wanted for their children and for their families and for their nation itself. No one could make that choice for them. They had to do that themselves. Today, the world sees that they're choosing cooperation over conflict, friendship over enmity, prosperity over poverty, and hope over despair. They are choosing a future in which Arabs and Israelis, Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live together, pray together, United Arab Emirates, and the people of the Kingdom of Bahrain, God bless you all. This is an incredible day for the world. This is a really wonderful and beautiful occasion. I want to thank all of the members of Congress for being here, senators, congressmen, congresswomen. We just appreciate it so much. Everybody wanted to be here. It's a very important day for the world. It's a very important day for peace. Before the party signed the accords, I'd like to ask Prime Minister Netanyahu to say a few words, followed by the Foreign Minister of the United Arab Emirates, and the Foreign Minister of Bahrain. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. Thank you.
Our dear friend, President Trump, First Lady Melania Trump, thank you for hosting me, my wife Sarah, and our entire delegation on this historic day. I want to recognize Vice President Pence, Secretary Pompeo, National Security Advisor O'Brien, and other cabinet members, Jared Kushner, Avi Berkowitz, Ambassador Friedman, and other members of the President's ABLE peace team, Senators, members of Congress, Israeli Ambassador Ron Dermer, his Emirate and Bahraini counterparts, as well as all the dignitaries gathered here on this sunny day. I want to uh, also express my gratitude for all the Israelis who have worked for years, uh, sometimes in less sunny climes, to bring this date, and I thank each and every one of you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, this day is a pivot of history. It heralds a new dawn of peace. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have prayed for peace. For decades, the Jewish state has prayed for peace. And this is why today we're filled with such profound gratitude. I am grateful to you, President Trump, for your decisive leadership. You have unequivocally stood by Israel's side. You have boldly confronted the tyrants of Tehran. You've proposed a realistic vision for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And you have successfully brokered the historic peace that we are signing today, a peace that has brought support in Israel, in America, in the Middle East, indeed in the entire world. I am grateful to Crown Prince Muhammad bin Zayed of the United Arab Emirates and to you, Foreign Minister Abdullah bin Zayed. I thank you both for your wise leadership and for working with the United States and Israel to expand the circle of peace. I am grateful. I am grateful to King Hamad of Bahrain and to you, Foreign Minister Abdul Latif Al Zayani, for joining us, joining us in bringing hope to all the children of Abraham. To all of Israel's friends in the Middle East, those who are with us today and those who will join us tomorrow, I say, Assalamu Alaikum, peace unto thee, Shalom. And you have heard from the President that he is already lining up more and more countries. This is unimaginable a few years ago, but with resolve, determination, a fresh look at the way peace is done, this is being achieved. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the people of Israel well know the the price of war. I know the price of war. I was wounded in battle. A fellow soldier, a very close friend of mine, died in my arms. My brother Yoni lost his life while leading his soldiers to rescue hostages held by terrorists at Antebe. My parents' grief over the loss of Yoni was unrelieved until their dying day. And over the years, when I've come to console the families of Israel's fallen soldiers and victims of terror, I have seen that same grief countless times. And this is why 
I am so deeply moved to be here today. For those who bear the wounds of war, cherish the blessings of peace. And the blessings of the peace we make today will be enormous. First, because this peace will eventually expand to include other Arab states, and ultimately, it can end the Arab-Israeli conflict once and for all. Second, because the great economic benefits of our partnership will be felt throughout our region, and they will reach every one of our citizens. And third, because this is not only a peace between leaders, it's a peace between peoples. Israelis, Emiratis, and Bahrainis are already embracing one another. We are eager to invest in a future of partnership, prosperity, and peace. We've already begun to cooperate on combating corona, and I'm sure that together we can find solutions to many of the problems that afflict our region and beyond. So despite the many challenges and hardships that we all face, despite all that, let us pause for a moment to appreciate this remarkable day. Let us rise above any political divide. Let us put all cynicism aside. Let us feel on this day the pulse of history. For long after the pandemic is gone, the peace we make today will endure. Ladies and gentlemen, I have devoted my life to securing Israel's place among the nations to ensure the future of the one and only Jewish state. To accomplish that goal, I work to make Israel strong, very strong. For history has taught us that strength brings security Strength brings allies, and ultimately, and this is something President Trump has said again and again, ultimately, strength brings peace. <laughs> King David expressed this basic truth thousands of years ago in our eternal capital, Jerusalem. His prayer, immortalized in the book of Psalms in the Bible, echoes from our glorious past and guides us towards a brilliant future. Adonai oz le'amo yiten, Adonai yevarech et amo b'shalom. May God give strength to his people. May God bless his people with peace. Mr. President, distinguished guests, this week is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And what a blessing we bring to this new year. A blessing of friendship, a blessing of hope, a blessing of peace. Thank you. The President of the United States, the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, and the Minister of the Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Bahrain will now sign the Declaration of Peace. They will each sign three copies, one in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. We kindly ask that all guests remain seated for the signing of the documents.
It's hard to it's hard to find words uh, to express the uh, the gratitude we should have, the historic biblical as some of you are commenting biblical significance of this event. We're talking about Israel. We're talking about the country God Himself set up, uh, His chosen people. We are all we who are Christians. We who are followers of Jesus Christ, born in that land are spiritual Semites. We are spiritually rooted in the Jewish uh, history, spirituality, prophecy, the covenant. I mean, this has a geopolitical significance and this has a Christian, Jewish, biblical significance. We, we, you know, to understand today, I mean, you can appreciate what you just saw, and to understand it more deeply, we really have to go back and study and review uh, the, the threats that have been launched against uh, Israel, the, uh, the Palestinian uh, conflict, uh, decades and decades of tension, uh, the terrorist attacks, uh, those who have made explicit declarations uh, that they want Israel wiped off uh, the face of the earth. And this is just one step today. It's actually the fruition of a lot of, of painstaking work to begin to heal relationships over there uh, and, um, and enter into an era of cooperation. What you saw today is like a first fruits because other nations are going to follow suit with what the UAE has done and Bahrain. Entering into these formal accords with Israel makes it possible, for example, for Jewish people and, and Muslims to, to worship uh, in peace over there. And, uh, to, uh, you know, as Israel has said, you know, the Muslims coming to the holy places can worship in peace and, and security. Uh, President Trump has been doing a lot. And, and, you know, three past presidential administrations have said, for example, and this is one of the things uh, has been leading up to uh, today's historic moment, that, uh, you know, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and should be recognized as such. And yet our embassy over there was not in Jerusalem. And Obama said, yeah, you know, we should move it there. And, uh you know, Clinton was expressing the same thing, Bill Clinton and, 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 and past presidents, President Bush. And yet, they didn't do it. They were afraid of pushback from the Arab nations. They were afraid. President Trump didn't just promise it, he did it. He recognized Jerusalem as the capital and moved our embassy there. He recognized, furthermore, Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights and removed the words occupied from the description of the West Bank. It's not just occupied territory. It's Israel's territory. It's hard to understand the significance of this unless we really remind ourselves of some of these things. I mean, I know, I, I, I know for myself you know, growing up, you know, we always, you know, hearing about the Middle East, you always had like a tinge of anxiety. It's like, 
oh my goodness, you know, what's going to happen over there? Are they going to lead the whole world into, into war? And, and, and remember what we were also growing up worried about was uh, the, the oil, right? Uh, where, where is our oil going to come from? We had such dependence upon some of these other countries for the oil. What is, what is one of the accomplishments now that we know coming from this presidency? We're energy independent. We are now the largest exporters of oil and natural gas in the world. We're energy independent now. We don't have to rely on countries in the Middle East or anywhere else for our oil. You know, amazing things are happening here. Prime Minister Netanyahu, he, that's all we need to hear him speaking this way. He's the one that makes it clear what a significant moment this is for our dear brothers and sisters of Israel, for our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith here at home. This is a must. And brothers and sisters, we're so grateful uh, that our president has done this, and, and there's more to come. We'll, the significance of this will be unfolding uh, with time, you know, and this is made possible by other steps the president took, for example, getting us out of the horrific Iran nuclear deal that, you know, Obama and Biden, oh my goodness, what, what, what they did allowing Iran to, to, to have such... Um, to, to get money from us, first of all, without properly making sure that they were not on the path to developing a nuclear weapon. And Obama-Biden, I mean, they send over plane loads of cash, plane loads filled with cash to Iran. I mean, what's wrong with these people? Biden has consistently been on the wrong side of foreign policy decisions throughout his career. Iran or, of course, China. Yeah, Biden and and, and cozying up to communist China. And, you know, the president has dealt with China, too, who has ripped off America for years of tens of billions of dollars and more intellectual property theft and imbalances in, in, in trade arrangements. You know, the president has stood up to that and said enough of this and has gotten tens of billions of dollars back from China instead of them continuing to steal from America. You know, this is, this is incredible. And uh, I wanted to show this to you uh, as the beginning of an educational process. And we'll be coming back to this over these, uh, these coming weeks uh, to help educate people to see that President Trump is not only good for America, he's good for the world. Uh, so many leaders uh, just don't understand how to bring things like this about. And, you know, many Americans, unfortunately, are, are not even aware of the significance of something like this. But, but, but you are, and we can all become increasingly aware of it. And that's why I wanted to show you that, that historic signing today. And watch, you'll see how many other nations uh, will, will say, hey, if they can do it, so can we. This is mutually beneficial. Let's establish these relationships now. And... Um, and, and, and put ourselves on a firm footing for the future. What kind of world uh, do we want to have uh, and do we want to leave to our, our, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? That's part of the question going on here that we, have to, uh, that we have to answer. So I see your comments coming in. I'd be happy to uh, uh, address some of them and answer questions. A lot of support. Uh, that you're expressing uh, for our president. Uh, you know, let's get out there and spread the word to others. And, uh, you know, it's accomplishments. This election has to be about accomplishments, not accusations. Uh, so many people like to accuse President Trump of so many ridiculous things. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, how about his accomplishments uh, like this one? 
and uh, the other, all the other things re 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 revolving around uh, Israel. And, um, you know, we who are priests uh, need to be speaking about these things. Some people don't understand. They want us to, you know, some people want us to live in the sacristy. And I'm sorry, that's not going to, that's not going to be uh, the, that's the case with, with me and with a lot of other priests. We're actually ordained to help you uh, to carry out your uh, responsibilities here in the world, uh, which include voting for the right kind of people that are going to secure peace in the world. That's why voting is actually an act of love for God and neighbor. We put, by putting the right people in office, like the president, we secure the rights of others, uh, like our, our friends in Israel and like uh, uh, really the whole world. And, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, <laughs> it's amazing how many religious uh, leaders seem to be completely clueless. You know, really, because some, some of them really are clueless. They're just not too well educated, some of them, uh, not too, too perceptive, uh, especially about world events. You know, some of them are totally ignorant about politics. And others are very well versed in politics, except they're completely on the wrong side uh, of it. And... Uh, uh, you know, anybody who's in league with the Democrats, uh, boy, you, you people have a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of penance to do. You know, really to be, being so utterly um, uh, destructive of uh, life, religious freedom, uh, just, just, just completely, uh, completely ignorant of uh, what is good and what is right and what is moral. Uh, unbelievable. Um, of course, something like this, Oh, the Democrats, there's a couple of people that watch, uh, watch these programs and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, their heads spin off uh, because um, something like this is, is very hard for them to deal with. Uh, but we, we give you the, the facts about, about events like this. And some of you are new to our channels, and I want to encourage you to connect with me uh, some of you are watching, I know, on Twitter, and I uh, want to encourage you to connect me with, with me there if you're not. It's at Fr Frank Pavone. Uh, that is uh, the, uh, the address, and uh, uh, Fr Frank Pavone. And uh, through our tweets, we help you to prepare for this election, and uh, we uh, bring you a lot of other information on the pro-life movement. Alvita and I uh, work together. Uh, fully and uh, been doing so for 15 years. She's a member of our, our full-time team here at Priests for Life and uh, uh, we are uh, uh, continuing to proclaim that um, the civil rights movement of today is the pro-life movement. One of you is asking about, uh, let's take some of your questions, one of you is asking about what I think of the consistently uh, pro-life bishops like Bishop Joseph Strickland of Texas. They're fantastic. Uh, I, I spoke with the, the bishop not too long ago, and uh, we, in fact, we were together on a radio program, and, you know, we've got some great voices out there. Uh, and, you know, religious leaders are not supposed to uh, do our thinking uh, for us. We're supposed to listen uh, to what they uh, have to say, but that never means that we turn our, our, uh, our minds off. Uh, I would never want to be in that position uh, in regard to anybody, do their thinking for them. No, we present uh, the perspectives that we have. We present the Word of God. We present the moral teaching, and we do it coherently, and we call people. We invite people. We do exactly what Jesus did. Jesus didn't impose himself on anybody. He proposed the truth. He showed the signs and wonders uh, and uh, invited people to faith. Cindy is asking, what does FR period stand for? Uh, in uh, my name, my title. It, it stands for Father. That's the name that we give uh, to uh, Catholic priests. And uh, uh, Father, why? Because as Scripture says, Paul says, I became your spiritual father. Why? It's because of preaching the Word of God, as we're commanded to do, we're ordained to do, uh, brings people to faith. It's an invitation to faith. Well, when people say yes to faith, when people say, yes, I believe, I believe in Jesus, and um, when Jesus comes into them at that point, it brings them life. And that's why we're called Father, bringing spiritual life. And especially in the Catholic community, we have the sacraments, and we believe that that too is the nourishment and the growth of spiritual life. 
uh, in, among our people. And uh, let's see, Linda is saying, how can Catholics or Christians vote for Biden uh, if he is pro-choice and, and Marxist? Yeah, well, I'd like to uh, hear them answer that question because there, there's, there's no justification for putting a, a, a public official in office who is dedicated to continuing the Holocaust against unborn children. Dedicated to it. Biden just does, you know, does not want to protect a single baby from abortion. Not a single one. Not a single one. And he wants you and me to pay for their destruction. And this is, this is the killing of children, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Roberta is asking, what's my opinion about Father James Altman being silenced for preaching truth and traditional Catholic theology? Uh, you know, when a priest... You know, and I've been through some of the same nonsense when a priest is um, uh, speaking uh, the truth and somebody in church authority wants him to be quiet about it. My question for that church authority is uh, twofold. Number one, what is it about what this priest is saying that is inconsistent with the church's teaching? And that's the specific question. Not... Did what he say get people angry? Not was he angry when he said it? Not do people have different opinions in response to what he's saying? The question is, is there anything about what he's saying that is inconsistent with what the church has always taught? And then question number two is, if not... Well then, if you're going to silence him, why did you ordain him? We are ordained to minister to God's people and to proclaim the truth of the gospel and of the church. When we're told not to do that, well, my response to church authorities, make up your mind. If you ordain me to teach the gospel, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to teach the gospel. And like St. Paul proclaims in Scripture, you know, uh, welcome or unwelcome, in season and out of season, we give that word. We give that word. Night Owl is asking, why aren't more bishops speaking? That's what I'd like to know. That's what, really what I would like to know. I don't know what some of them are doing. I honestly don't know. Don't even know what they are doing. Now, last night I spoke about, um, Julie, maybe you were asleep, I spoke about President Trump being a great uniter of this country. And he is. He's never been a president that unites us more. And uh, that's because, you know, we have a choice to make. It's not just that we say to somebody, and this is the same thing with the priests. These, these questions are actually... Uh, go together very well. Some people will talk about priests like myself or, or Father uh, Altman. Uh, hey, Jerry, it's very real. Go talk to the Pope if you have a problem. Um, uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, people say, oh, oh, we're being divisive. And No, we're not. No, we're not. Christianity is divisive. The cross is a sign of contradiction. Division comes because some people hate the truth. That's all. Division comes because some people prefer darkness to light. So what are the people of the light supposed to do? Pretend that there's no difference between light and darkness? You know, it's, 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 it's just superficial silliness when people uh, uh, pro, uh, are complaining that there's division. Of course, it's always going to be division. There always was division. It's division that got Jesus Christ crucified. Was he to come down from the cross? Was he to listen to Peter's advice? And, uh, you know, say, oh, Lord, God forbid that this should happen to you. In other words, Lord, don't get anybody mad. Don't get anybody mad. Brothers and sisters, it's impossible to follow that advice. Not, don't get anybody mad. T totally, uh, totally ridiculous piece of advice. Because whether people are going to get mad depends on the people. So, Yeah. The president actually is a uniter of our country. Why? Because two things, two pillars of that, as you see me explain in detail last night. Number one is success. Success unites. Get us a successful economy, uh, strong uh, borders, identify uh, our, our, what our nation is and what is. You don't have a nation if you don't have borders. 
uh, success in trade relationships, success in what we saw unfold before our eyes today in promoting peace in the world. And uh, you can unite around success. And success means that everybody is more free, everybody is more prosperous. That's the kind of success that he works for here in America. That unites, and also focusing on the principles that America was founded on, uniting around our flag, around our constitution, around our national anthem, around our history, loving our history, respecting our history, educating children in our history. These are things that the president stands for and speaks for, and brothers and sisters, that's the source of unity. You want to talk about unity? You need to be united around something. And the church, Jacob, needs to proclaim that. Separation of church and state means the state is not to infringe on the freedom of the church to be the church. And that's where President Trump is also succeeding day after day. Succeeding in defending the freedom of the church. President Trump is succeeding day after day in encouraging us to speak you know, some of you are talking about uh, bishops. Um, I'll tell you what, I get more encouragement to speak my mind from the pulpit and everywhere else from President Trump than I do from uh, the Catholic bishops. Because he said, we in America, we need to hear what you, the clergy, have to say. We need to hear the Word of God and we need to hear it unhindered. And he promised and he said, I, as, a, as the president and uh, uh, leader of the executive branch of our government, will insist with all the government agencies that they never interfere with the freedom of the church. That's what separation of church and state means. It's not, it doesn't mean the church is supposed to shut her mouth, as some people think I should do. Oh, shut up! That's not what separation of church and state means. Father Frank can't talk about politics. Father Altman can't talk about politics. Bishop Strickland can't talk about politics. Archbishop Viganello shouldn't talk about politics. That's not what the separation of church and state means. It means that the state cannot tell the church to shut up. That's what it means. Go study the history. And some of these people who, uh, uh, you know, invoke this phrase, they don't know what in the world they are talking about. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, brothers and sisters, for spending some time with me. Uh, we, you know, we need your help. Many of you are watching, uh, watching us on Alveda's channels, and she and I are constantly uh, uh, spreading the message together that we need you to step up to the plate and help us with this election. Now, one of the simple ways to do that, I'm going to give you a simple website, and go to prolifevolunteer.com prolifevolunteer.com and you'll be seeing there a uh, short questionnaire uh, whereby you can let us know how you may want to help. It may be distributing some literature or we even need people to make phone calls to voters or knock on doors. We'll give you some training for that. Uh, but groups are, are really activating uh, volunteers all around the country and we're doing that ourselves as well. So I want to ask you to go to ProLifeVolunteer.com, sign up to help with the election, and, uh, and our team will be in touch with you and give you the, uh, the training. As Grace is saying, it's so imperative for us to speak up and to speak up loudly. Sarah is mentioning California's restriction on the churches, and uh, that's a violation of the separation of church and state. Um, sure, the state is, is responsible to you know, take measures for public health, uh, but they're going, uh, going overboard in, in terms of what's happening uh, with the churches there. And, uh, you know, uh, let's see. Let's see a few other comments here before we finish. Um, yeah, a lot of you are making uh, very good points about, uh, you know, people should stop blaming the president for everything. This is the same thing about President George W. Bush, you know, and the hurricane comes, oh, it's President Bush's fault, and, you know, everything that happens, and, oh, he's a racist, by the way, and, you know, these are tired, old tools of attack. Nobody ever called President, nobody ever called Donald Trump a racist until he started running for president. Uh, my goodness. Uh, uh, let's see, Olga, thank you for speaking up. Uh, this is why I became a Republican, she said, for pro-life, because of pro-life. Um, can Trump do anything about shutdowns? That's a good question, uh, Cindy. Uh, well, you saw him recently in Nevada uh, and in North Carolina uh, at his rallies. And uh, by the way, join me Thursday night uh, at 9 o'clock. We'll watch President Trump's rally uh, together. And um, 
you know, uh, he said to the governors of those uh, states, open it up, open up the state. Now, you know, he believes in the way that the Constitution has um, uh, defined the relative authority between the federal government and the state governments. We are the United States of America, so each state has its own constitution, its own governor, its own legislature, its own court system. Um, and so these are 50 different systems of government. And uh, so it's, it's, it's crucially important that they, they have their sovereignty. And so, you know, the president uh, can appeal to them and he can also, you know, uh, uh, apply certain pressure in terms of uh, uh, what the federal government is willing to, uh, to do. You know, he's got a carrot and a stick and he's able to uh, encourage the states that uh, they'll have the help that they need with the federal government and... Uh, uh, but the states are sovereign and so sometimes he can only appeal to them and appeal to the people and the president does that he speaks directly to the people and he's uh, very effective in that and urge the people to put pressure on their governors uh, to uh, open up their states well, why is it this is the democrat governors that are keeping them shut down and uh, it's really uh, you know it's really gone too far it's time to uh, you know get our churches open get our schools open uh, do it safely, but do it effectively. And let's get it done. But thank God for what uh, happened today, this historic peace accord uh, between the uh, Israel, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain. Uh, they did it. They stepped up to the plate. They did it. And President Trump has been encouraging this and will continue to encourage it. You heard them say, them say it for themselves. The gratitude that they have to our president to live the like it or not, United States is a leader in the, on the world stage, the leader really, and uh, we have um, a lot to be grateful for. Um, one of you is saying pro-lifers vote. I have worked the polls before. Sign up with your county board of elections. Dave, thank you for mentioning that. We've got to uh, not only um, vote and get others to vote. And vote red, remove every Democrat, Brian, remove every single Democrat, Brian. Maybe we've got to remove you from public office if you ever tried to run for it. I'd, I'd, just, I'd move in order to vote against some of these people. Remove every Democrat. Remove them. Remove them now. Remove them forever. Uh, because they, they've, they've, you know what? I'm going to tell you something about the Democrat Party. They have sacrificed their, uh, their right to gain a single vote. Uh, that's all. That, that's just pure and simple. They have sacrificed it. They've thrown it away, burned it up, ripped it up, thrown it in the garbage, trampled it underfoot. You, you seriously? Yeah, uh, Mary's talking about jokes. You want to know what a joke is in public, uh, public service, public life, politics? You want to know what lies are? Being a public servant and saying it's okay to kill a baby. Being a public servant, Francisco Sauceda, you believe in allowing babies to be killed? Like Cheryl is saying, they've sold their souls to hell. They really have, to the devil. The devil, like Patricia is saying. When are, when are people going to wake up some of you, some of you that are watching, it's weird. I'm listening. I, 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 as some of you that are watching, you're like, it's really weird the way you think. I don't think you think. You're being led around. There's like a noose around your mind and you're being pulled around by the Democrats. What's wrong? What's wrong? with people that they say it's okay to kill babies. You're killing babies. The abortionists who kill them admit what it is. They admit what it is. What are you, oblivious to this? We're living in the middle of a Holocaust and the people who are conducting the Holocaust are laughing at the people who say, oh, this is women's rights, reproductive choice. And meanwhile, the abortionists are getting rich on our taxpayer money and we've got these deceived, ignorant people going around saying this is freedom of choice. What a, what a joke. The joke's on you, Biden supporters. 
the joke's on you, Democrats. You look like idiots. Celebrating women's freedom and choice. Meanwhile, all these women are being oppressed. These women are being, we work with them every day. They are deeply hurt and offended by the Democrat Party who sold them a lie. That sold them a lie. That, that somehow this would be of help to them. And we work, one of the things we do, brothers and sisters, if you're not familiar with it. And you know what? Alveda King... And many of you are, are, are listening to um, us on her channels. Do you know that she is um, part of our Silent No More campaign? Do you know that she had two abortions? Alveda King. And she talks about it publicly because she is part, and we started working together 15 years ago when we first met. Uh, we first met in 1999. And as we started uh, working together, you know, she learned that we had this Silent No More campaign, which is an effort, my friends, to bring healing to those that have had abortions. Those have been deceived, deceived by, you know, these Democrat policies that it's okay to kill a baby. Uh, gosh, I always have to stop and think, is it possible that there can be a human being that can think that? I mean, it's hard. It really is hard to... Hard to believe, Anne, isn't it? Uh, you know, and it's because people don't speak up about politics that our politics go to hell. If you don't speak up and warn people in politics to get on the road of virtue, they end up getting on the road to hell. And, 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 and that's, that's where our politics has been going. And abortion is one of the symptoms of that. But those that have fallen into these lies... They experience the pain. They experience the wound of abortion. And Alveda came to know that we have this Silent No More campaign, first of all, that promotes the healing for these people. And then, once people find healing in the Lord, I'm sure many of you have, right, from various things, maybe not, not abortion, but Alveda had these abortions and she experienced deep pain. But then she turned to the Lord and found his forgiveness. And then she noticed that we had this campaign where other people who had turned to the Lord and found forgiveness, you know what they felt? They felt that uh, they wanted to speak out. They wanted to share with other people their experience of abortion so that others who might be tempted to do it would realize it's a dead end, doesn't solve any problems, it only creates new ones. And for those that had already done it and maybe felt that those wounds, like Laura is saying, which are so deep, were too deep to be forgiven, they would get new hope when they heard other people speak up and say, I have been forgiven. And that's what Alvita said, I want to do that too. She said to us, I want to be part of your campaign. I remember her calling up one day uh, to our executive director, uh, uh, Janet, uh, Janet Morana, and uh, calling her up and saying, I want to be part of your campaign. And Janet said, well, I, 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 you already are. You're working together with us. She said, no, I mean your Silent No More campaign. I had an abortion. I had two abortions. And, um, well, we eagerly welcomed her to do that. And she has been a spokesperson ever since. For so many men and women who join our Silent No More campaign and say, I want to share with others the fact that I had an abortion and that I, first of all, fell for a lie because it was, it was no solution to any problem. It only called, created more problems. And secondly, I want to speak up against the lie that this is unforgivable because some People are stuck in that despair. They don't even want to raise their eyes to, to God because they feel like God is just going to smack, smack them down and reject them and abandon them and send them to hell and that the church, the doors are closed and they can't even go into the church. You know what our message is? And I want to conclude with this. Our message is that no longer do those who have had abortions need to be 
on the ground, curled up in, in, a, in, a, in a ball of, of, of despair and shame and darkness with their faces to the ground, unable to even look up. But rather, our message is that there is a Savior there who is speaking to them, shining light into that dark corner and saying, you may arise because I have died for your sins. My blood washes you clean. There is hope. There is new life. God has a plan for you. Raise up from this place. Get up. Rise, open your eyes, look to the heavens, take my hand, let me lift you up out of that despair. That's what we're doing every day. As we do this work, that's a big part of what we do here in this ministry. We take the hands of these people who are, have sunk into despair and we lift them up and we say, there is hope for you. That's what it means to be pro-life. That's what it means to be silent no more. That's what... Alveda King has experienced, and go to silentnomore.com. You'll see what I mean. Go to abortiontestimonies.com. You'll see. Read those testimonies, and you'll be inspired. So one of you is asking, when can you uh, hear uh, me again? Every night at 9 o'clock and every morning at 10 a.m. for the Mass. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Faith is asking, how do we get involved and support? Okay, our main website, endabortion.us. You can sign up for emails there. You can donate. You can see our projects that we need your help with. Endabortion.us, because that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to be better than anybody else. We're not trying to control anybody's life. We're not trying to, to, uh, to, to, to create problems. We're trying to stop the killing of children. And we also know leadership when we see it. And we love America. And that's what we're going to continue to advocate for. Do you do anything in the Philly suburbs? Yes. We have, in fact, our Rachel's Vineyard ministry. We were just talking about the healing after abortion. Our Rachel's Vineyard ministry is based right outside of Philadelphia, and Father Dennis Wild, our associate director, is um, in the Philadelphia area as well. So we have a good base of operations there, actually, and I go there regularly and uh, hope to see you there. But friends, sign up for our, our ministry, connect with our ministry, get our emails, endabortion.us. Tell us about yourselves. Subscribe to our channels here, wherever, uh, wherever uh, you may be watching, and... Um, and let's get, uh, let's get behind uh, this president. Nobody has saved more lives, saved more lives. Some people, I mean, save is a four-letter word. Kill is a four-letter word. I guess, I guess some people get them, uh, get them confused. I really, have to, I really have to laugh at you know, people politically who uh, get on some kind of moral high horse and they complain about President Trump uh, you know, as if he's, he's taking lives. First of all, anybody who uh, uh, buys into the Democrat platform has lost all moral authority to talk about uh, be caring about lives or taking lives or killing because it's the party of death. It's the party of death. They believe in killing. They believe in killing baby. If you, can, if you can't respect the life of a little baby, how can you respect anybody else's life? Uh, but really, we have, we're on a path now, thanks to his taking billions of dollars away uh, from the abortion industry, uh, has saved countless lives, uh, saved countless lives of Americans from this uh, pandemic, doing something that Biden thought was hysterical and xenophobic. Listen, you don't want to trust him with any decision, Biden. You don't want to trust him with anything. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans would have died from this Wuhan China virus had Biden's advice won the day. It's xenophobic. It's judgmental. Judgmental statement. It's xenophobic. To cut off travel. To me, there's nothing more logical than if some kind of a problematic disease, a virus, contagious virus, 
is, is, is bubbling up in a particular part of the world, that until you know how to deal with it and what it is, you try to stop it from spreading, what do you say? You can't come here from there. This is, this is, I mean, you know, a big part of leadership is not having an insight or coming to a conclusion that nobody else can come to. That, that, that leadership doesn't necessarily require that. Very often leaders do do that. But leadership doesn't necessarily require coming to a conclusion that nobody else can come to. Leadership means being able to come to the same conclusion that any right-thinking person would come to and having the courage to act on it despite the opposite advice coming from others that are pressuring you. That is leadership. And that's the kind of leadership the president has been exercising uh, throughout this crisis and is exercising today. So thank you, friends, for sharing with me. Uh, uh, watching that was just so moving, so beautiful. For us people of faith especially, we understand the biblical significance of this. Uh, and may everybody see that God has given us uh, a leader in President Trump that uh, we should be grateful for and that we need to support. Go to promiseskept.com to read about all his various accomplishments. And meanwhile, brothers and sisters, We'll see you in the morning. We'll have Mass at 10 o'clock. I'll be giving you some other broadcasts earlier in the morning, but we'll have Mass at 10 and uh, another session uh, together tomorrow night as well. May the Lord bless you and strengthen you now, protect you, answer all your prayers, and make you strong defenders of the unborn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for all your prayers, all your encouragement, all your, your comments all your activities in union with us. Thanks, brothers and sisters, and have a wonderful night.